Welcome everyone to Self Principle, that's sleep, exercise, love and food. As always, I'm Dr. Sean Hashmi. Now today's topic is all about the role of vitamin K2 and chronic kidney disease. We've already talked about vitamin K2 and all of its benefits, but today let's focus on what is its role in kidney disease and whether or not you ought to supplement with it. So the background on kidney disease is a very scary and sad statistic, and that is that patients with chronic kidney disease are actually more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than they are to progress to dialysis. There's a statistics from, um, this is Dalrymple, I want to make sure I say that correctly, Dalrymple and colleagues, they did a forward or longitudinal cohort study following people for about 10 years. And during those 10 years follow-up, about 5% of the people they followed progressed to dialysis. But 61% of those people died of some kind of a cardiovascular event. So the number of people that get affected by heart disease when they have kidney disease is substantial. And by heart disease, we're really talking about calcification, the stiffening of all of your blood vessels and the clogging of your blood vessels. And the thing that triggers all of this is as kidney function declines, the body has a harder time getting rid of phosphorus. And that triggers a cascade of events which we call chronic kidney disease, mineral bone disease or CKD, MBD. Essentially, what happens is is that as phosphorus starts to retain, it affects so many different parts of the body. The take-home that you have to understand is the higher the phosphorus, the higher the likelihood that you're going to have calcification inside your body, which is all this calcium depositing and stiffening up your blood vessels, and the higher the risk of mortality or the risk of dying. Now, vitamin K2, and remember that's different from vitamin K1. Just about every multivitamin has K1, but today we're focusing on K2. K2 is important because one, there's amazing data coming out on it. Two, it's not really in any of the multivitamins out there. We've talked about food sources, and when it comes to food sources, it's really fermented foods, natto, cheese, butter, and it's also found in egg yolks, poultry, and liver. And if you're somebody like me who's plant-based, it's not a bad idea to think about supplementing with it. But the other place where K2 comes from is from bacteria. So intestinal bacteria, the bacteria inside our gut, is also really important in forming it. Now what we know is that the lower the K2 in the body, the higher the risk of things like atherosclerosis, things like calcifications in your blood vessels going on, calciphylaxis, which could be leading to necrosis in different parts of the body, including things like your fingers. Of course, there's higher fracture risk, and this all occurs more often in chronic kidney disease and dialysis patients. Now, these are correlation, not causation studies. But what we want to know is, what is the data that kind of helps us to understand this stuff? Well, there's one thing you got to know. There's a protein called the matrix GLA protein. This is a really important protein because when this protein is around in its active form, it actually prevents calcification of your blood vessels. Now, the un sort of active form, which is the dephosphorylated and uncarboxylated form, that one is a great marker to know if you have vitamin K2 deficiency. So in other words, the higher this inactive matrix GLA form is, the lower you are to have vitamin K stores going on. Now, the reason this becomes important is because K2, specifically vitamin K2, is a cofactor in taking this matrix GLA protein from the sort of uncarboxylated form, or what I'm calling inactive form, to its active form, or the carboxylated version going on. And essentially what the carboxylated version does is it's going to prevent the calcium and the phosphorus from depositing inside the artery walls. So now you understand that K2 works through this matrix GLA protein and it's very, very important. But the issue in chronic kidney disease is that K2 absorption is also a factor. Remember, one of the things that makes K2 is bacteria. So what happens? As chronic kidney disease worsens and you start to get uremia or toxins building up, those actually affect the gut microbiome. They cause something called gut 
dysbiosis, which means that the type of bacteria get affected. And as a result of that, you're not making as much K2 from those bacteria lying in your gut, you're not absorbing it, and so that also decreases the amount of vitamin K2 inside your body. Now, the other stuff that can also reduce vitamin K2 inside your body is actually phosphate binders. So think about that. Your kidney function gets worse, we want you to take phosphate binders, and those phosphate binders can actually reduce vitamin K2 absorption. The other stuff is antibiotics can do that, proton pump inhibitors can do that, but the big stuff really is keep in mind about the phosphate binders. You need the phosphate binders, but what you can really focus on is changing your diet so that you're eating a more plant-based diet so that the absorption of phosphorus goes down. Remember, the difference between animal-based versus plant-based phosphorus is plant-based gets about half the absorption as animal-based does. All right. Now, the type of um, K2 that we end up taking is important. There are many different types, and we've talked about that in a separate video, but the one that you want to look at on a bottle is MK7, and MK7 is the one that has a longer half-life. It's much better absorbed than the other ones out there, so that's why we like it. And what we know about it is, is that the studies are mixed. Some studies show that taking things like vitamin K2, specifically MK7, will actually show reductions in calcification. But if you look at some other studies, they'll show that there wasn't any difference. The reason for that is, is we need longer randomized control studies to be able to get to the heart of the matter. But you have to also think about what's the benefit but what's the side effect. So from a safety perspective, vitamin K2 is actually very safe to administer. It's very well tolerated. People have hardly any side effects, but if they do, it'll be a little bit of stomach upset, but that's about it. And what they've seen is, is that if you take vitamin K2, it doesn't increase the risk of blood clots, even as doses as high as 360 micrograms per day. Now, of course, when it comes to patients who are taking vitamin K antagonists like Coumadin or Warfarin, those patients should not supplement with vitamin K2. But if you watch this video and this podcast and you're wondering, well, what's the take-home message? The take-home message is, is first, vitamin K2 plays a key role in how calcium and phosphate deposit in the blood vessels, so calcification. We're still trying to find out what is the right dose, how long you have to take it for it to have a benefit. But even with the little data that we have, where some is positive, some doesn't show any benefit, there's still enough information out there to say you ought to think about supplementing with vitamin K2. Keep in mind, we need longer studies to have a definitive answer. But right now, from a safety perspective and the potential benefit perspective, the risk-benefit ratio seems in favor of taking it. As always, thank you so much for listening to this podcast, watching this video. If you have any questions or what topics you'd like to hear about, drop me a line at selfprincipal at gmail.com. Thanks so much, and I'll see you guys next time.